Ah, uh, Baldur's Gate 3, a game designed around your interactions with your quirky party members and your deep interconnected backstories. Every combat encounter is tailor-made for teamwork within your group of allies, to overcome and outsmart the challenges the game presents you with a variety of banter and abilities your party provides you. However, do you know how many times my party members have triggered traps after I clearly walked around them? Or how about all that gold I spent reviving them after a single pixel got them caught in a thunder wave? Or when Gale made the ultimate sacrifice? No more. Today, I embark on a journey by myself to beat Baldur's Gate 3 all on my lonesome. This is the Lone Wolf Challenge. As with these types of videos, here are the arbitrary set of rules that go along with it. By honor of rules, I am essentially the only character in the party, excluding a few exceptions. I will be playing in balanced mode, because I don't hate myself. Playing as Gale is not allowed, since kamikaze your way to the credits is the lazy way out, and would end this run very early. And we need that CONTENT BABY! I'm allowed to have people join my party as long as they do not cast spells that directly help me with combat, ability checks, saving throws, or they themselves do any of those actions. We are playing modded Baldur's Gate 3 with the following list of mods that matter toward gameplay, including 5e spells and reaction sneak attack. This is to make the gameplay experience as similar as possible to actual D&D 5th edition, which is the system this game is based on. The rest are cosmetic and do not alter gameplay. Any in-game exploits not based on mods are allowed and free game. Temporary allies are allowed as long as they are not permanent party members or hirelings, so having characters like Halson or Jahira temporarily is allowed, and summons are also allowed. We now start our game by making a character you'd probably see on Tumblr and aptly name them according to the run. So guys, this is our solo run character. The DMs only friend yep because this is a one person show and started ourselves as a fiend warlock this will give us a much needed health boost in the early game and quick access to spell slots through short rests as far as spell coverage goes we took booming blade and eldritch blast for a melee to range spell coverage and the most important first level spell command which allows us to get a very particular item in the early game that we'll be using for all of Act 1. And our guardian is just a dark mirror of me. So, after getting a worm put in my eyeball, we meet Lazelle, who I made sure to assert my dominance over. Okay, easy enough. We have to kill everyone. Yeah, that's cool. Shut up, Lazelle. You're not part of the story. Unfortunately, the game forces Lazel to be within your party in this section, so by honor rules, we just skip our turn and call it a day while annihilating these imps. Pretty soon after, we free God's favorite princess, find our good old tutorial chest, and make our way to the helm. Our eldritch daddy tells us to get to the tr Transrio Crespontator, or whatever, while he fights off the dangerous devil man with the big sword, which is the item we need to get since it's locked out of the game once you finish the tutorial. Along the way to here, you should have been picking up these purple explodey things since it trivializes like a lot of the game. So, after expertly positioning myself and grabbing these barrels, I cast Command Drop. Um, uh, <laughs> I said, I cast Command Drop! Oh, thank you. Took my sword and went skydiving without a parachute. After getting off the beach, our hot goth cleric reminds us that it's dangerous to go alone. Charging off by yourself sounds like a fine way to get killed. Oh, you know it. Luckily, with the company of barrels, we aren't alone, and we have the power of overpowered game mechanics by our side. Yeah! <laughs> Genius strategy. You guys see how efficiently I, I did that? Aren't I cool as fuck? And after meeting this weird vampire twink, we promptly told him to fuck off and sent him to camp after he held a knife to my throat, which I honestly think is a reasonable response considering the events that happened today. After that encounter, we leveled up, which gave us a few very good options for our warlock. We chose Charm Person as our next first level spell, which is super useful during roleplay encounters. 
since we didn't have the friend's cantrip. And we also gained two Eldritch Invocations. We took Repelling Blast, which would allow us to knock enemies back from a distance, which if you've played Baldur's Gate 3, you've seen many combat encounters ended by simply knocking people off of cliffs. And for our second invocation, we took Devil's Sight, which allows you to perfectly see through magical darkness, which is a strategy my friends won't hear me shut up about. After struggling to move this rock with my weak little nerd arms, I had to ask my goth cleric for help, and I sent her back to camp and took everything inside the chest. Soon after, we met Gale. Hello, I'm Gale. And we drop a massive brick on these unsuspecting NPCs, because I'm a heartless, friendless okay, bastard. Oh, and we kill these two people as well. After convincing the man behind the door that I'm the e-girl he was looking for, he found out I was actually not in fact an e-girl, and was in fact a psychopath. As he desperately runs to the door for help of his friends, I loudly and aggressively break his spine with an Eldritch Blast to not alert suspicion. Now, normally, a 1v4 scenario like this would cause a lot of problems for someone who is low level like myself. However, as you can see, there's a barrel in the center of the room, which means my job just got a whole lot easier. Perfect. I should have high ground, but it's okay. Nice. Now, I begin looting the entire area, only to find minimal reward, along with a ton of useless books that, for some reason, are all the same books? Like, come on, Larry, and you could have made this a little more interesting, I'm just saying. To hell. After pushing this big shiny button, this somehow activates the undead, who are actually a very challenging encounter. Just me, a level 2 warlock, against 5 skeletons. So, how do we make this encounter easier? It's actually really simple. You can just loot their equipment off of them before the encounter begins, which leaves them mostly defenseless. That would be the case, but 4 of them are spellcasters, so I actually have to try to play the game. Luckily, the AI will chase you down here, so we can play around this doorway here and group them together for a very important spell, Burning Hands, dealing 11 damage to two of them and killing one, leaving us in a better position for the fight since they have no healing abilities while they're down a creature. After the Burning Hand spell, they got butt hurt and cast Silence on me, so I wasn't able to cast spells. Luckily, Arson doesn't require verbal components. With two of them left, it was a simple task of using a couple of cantrips to return them to the grave. Finishing this encounter gives you access to Withers, an NPC who lets you respec your class and stats for the low, low price of 100 gold. We will see each other again. Venturing out of our first dungeon, we once again find Lazel in a wooden cage that she could break very easily, but doesn't for some reason. We scare off the tieflings and free our non-important toad girl. Uh, wait for me in camp. We make our way to the Emerald Grove, where we encounter a bunch of goblins. For the life of me, I couldn't hit. I, I just couldn't. I, I, I kept missing. Luckily, Will is there to save the day and carry me to victory. Once inside, we convinced our way into the Druid Grove and gave our very accurate recollection of the goblin encounter to Volo. Goblins were of a rare gem-colored hue and wielded magic blowguns. <laughs> mistook obvious silver dragon for brass. <laughs> and leveled up to level 3, which lets us take the Pact of the Blade in the most important spell for this run, Darkness, which you will see later is completely busted in in so many ways. In order to make this run easier, I abused an exploit which allows you to gain the entire inventory of a trader by initiating a trade conversation with an NPC on your controller and then switching to keyboard and mouse, you can right click any item and send it to camp for free, which you can do for their entire inventory. This is so completely broken and I'm glad they fixed it in a recent patch, but it certainly makes my life a lot easier. So, I proceeded to see I, uh, I mean, acquire all of these items from the traders in the Emerald Grove. On a quest to take everything that this place was worth, I also took the Rune of the Wolf from this guy right here and opened the Druid Vaults before even doing anything with the Goblin Camp. After becoming richer than my landlord, I recruited Will to sit in my camp after I saw him bully a child. I offered my services to the tieflings and set out into the wilderness to murder everything in my path for more experience. 
Unfortunately for these two cultists, they weren't worshipping their new god, me. I then snuck around yeah, the we'll owlbear cave to pendant. get some loot, turned invisible to avoid confrontation with an owlbear, and met the best boy in the game. Mm. There's death in your scent. After wandering for a little bit, I encountered these two guys talking with Auntie Ethel, who is definitely not a hag. I couldn't persuade them to just let me handle it, so I left them to die because, you know, I'm not stupid. After convincing my way into the Blighted Village, I immediately broke their trust and attacked these ogres with Barrelmancy because I really wanted this headband of intellect, which boosts your intelligence to a 17. Luckily, the village didn't see anything that happened, despite the massive explosion, and I made my way down into the area with the Archmage's laboratory. Now, you may be wondering why I'm stacking up crates right here for seemingly no reason. Just watch a second. That's right, underground areas don't have ceilings, I presume for camera reasons? So you can just jump over walls despite the laws of physics. This exploit allows us to gain access to the laboratory without needing to do any combat whatsoever and gets us a very powerful item, the Necromancy of Thay. Before we can open and read it though, we need to gather a dark amethyst from the Fae Spider Cave which you can access from either the forge or the well in the Blend Village. This encounter with the face spider mother is actually a really challenging encounter at low levels, so a lot of preparation is needed in order to kill her. And yeah, we just we knocked go. her into a chasm. Okay, that, <laughs> yeah, that works too. We grabbed our dark amethyst and read the necromancy of Thay. If you succeed a series of skill checks, you'll get the permanent buff forbidden knowledge, which boosts your wisdom, saving throws, and ability checks by one. And we need every inch we can get in this run. I pushed further into the Blighted Village, wanting to fight the kinky couple because I thought it would give a decent amount of experience. I unfortunately soon found out that tall enemies can apparently see me perfectly fine through magical darkness despite me basically being in a smoke cloud. Because they're tall, I, I guess? I don't know. Much to my frustration, I move on and meet our resident Disney villain. I am Raphael. Very much at your service. Hey, Raphael, I'm the DM's only friend. Charmed, I'm sure, in more ways than one. I moved on to Joaquin's Rest and rescued Benrin and this other chick. I'm afraid Papa thanks Mr. Wait. I took my quest reward and didn't help Benrin because he annoyed me earlier. Bro. Really? Wait, you need help up? Dude, get up! Get the fuck up. Oh my god, he's so stupid. Okay. Now feeling more confident in my abilities, I take on this null encounter within my darkness cloud. Normally, most enemies don't go into darkness out of fear of having my flaming greatsword smack them on the way in, but these four gnolls had a very different strategy. Uh... Luckily, after robbing all of the merchants, I had plenty of spell scrolls to take care of them, and cleaned up the encounter by charismatically smacking them with the Everburn Blade. I introduced Sorry, myself to Karlak. I'm Karlak. And you are. I'm the DM's only friend. And helped her deal with the Paladins of Tears. Dip our weapon. Need any advantage I can get. And then. We. Okay. Quick saving again. We use an item. We use the Lightning Elemental Arrow. We shoot the Nodlord Tank. Finishing off the last member, we gained another level, taking Shatter as our new second level spell, and an ability score improvement to our Charisma and Dexterity, bringing them to 18 and 16 respectively. Making my way into the goblin camp, I spied a merchant who I immediately stole everything from and intimidated this goblin into handing over the owlbear cub, because, I mean, I love this little guy. Pushing our way inside, we gained the brand of the Absolute for additional dialogue options and talked to this guy because he gives a permanent buff by beating you. Okay, we're just gonna skip this. Moving into the prison where they're keeping Halson, we quickly dispatch the child who alerts the rest of the camp and pretty easily kill the rest of the enemies in here with the help of our new bear friend. And of course, darkness. All right. Doing blade, ah, uh, he's got that. All right, they're knocked out. I tell him to stay behind and talk my way through the encounter with Dror Ragslin so I can use the ultimate strategy to eliminate him. Okay, and we go to camp again and we pick up some more barrels. Two more barrels should do it, right? Yes! 
Yeah, yes, you will reign. Items. Fire damage. Oh my god. After literally nuking that encounter, I wanted to do something similar to Minthara. So I stealthily positioned myself on the rafters and thought I could jump stealthily if I had Featherfall. I was wrong. Fuck. I quickly ran away from the fight to grab Halson from the prison, thinking I could long rest with him in the party. After discovering Halson as a Walmart manager. See that. We have work to do. Enemies to kill. I took on this fight with just a tinge of salt. Halson. I mean, you know, we need to chill them right now. Bro, like, what the f are you doing? Like, how about you shut the f up? Let me do what my thing. And shut the hell up, bro. Barely managing to scrape by. Knowing that I couldn't take the third leader without a long rest, I removed Halson from my party, and he just went back to the prison, and he let me rest. Larian, what the f I should have been able to long rest with him as a temporary companion. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, whatever. Third fight, he's a bear. I cast darkness. We win. Wait, what? I'm, I'm sorry. Two critical hits in a row? Excuse me? Okay, let me do some explaining here. Whenever you are inside darkness, creatures that are targeting you should essentially be blind unless they have devil's sight. Cool. Blinded creatures have disadvantage on attacks meaning any attack against me within darkness should have disadvantage, meaning the chance of a single critical hit happening inside darkness is a 1 in 400 chance, or about 0.25%, okay? To have a second critical hit occur right after is insane, since it's a 1 in 20 chance of happening. That means the chances of these two crits happening against me has a 1 in 8,000 chance of happening, or about 0.0125%. And this has been happening across my entire playthrough. I've just cut out some bits like that since it wasn't very entertaining. So what game mechanic could cause low-level enemies to score crits more often and have the AI behave in strange ways? Karmic Dice. Karmic Dice is a mechanic that will counteract your bad rolls if you get multiple bad ones in a row. But apparently, it also applies to enemies. Like, what? So if you have high AC like me, and are forcing creatures to constantly roll at disadvantage, like me, then you're gonna have those enemies rack up that karma until it stacks onto itself causing situations like this. Anyway, I really don't fix this until later, because I forgot it was a mechanic. So, that's like near the end of Act 1, and it doesn't matter, since I killed everybody. Halson congratulated me, I looted everything, and went back to the Emerald Grove, knowing the goblins outside would be pretty angry I just killed their leadership. After once again stealing all of the inventory from the merchants, you are in debt to the DM. only for He will reward you for your efforts. Oh. Thank you. I cannot imagine taking on a camp full of goblins was a simple task. No, there was a lot of saves saves going involved. Um, it is a hell full of blood and ash. To be expected. I'm glad you survived intact. Where is the rune? My apologies. It seems to have been taken. Uh, we threw a party to celebrate my murder spree, and Volo showed me his unique party trick of stabbing my eye. But he did give me permanency and visibility, so I, I guess it's cool. Seeing that Gale had the arcane hunger effect, I went to talk to him so he wouldn't explode. But apparently Gale's horniness took precedence over his life. Yeah, Gale... Look, I'm just... You're a really good guy, but... Man, I need... Yeah, look, bud, I, I can't. I can't. It's just, you know, you're so arrogant and kind of, like, meh. And you, like, also ate, like, my, like some of my magic items, so I, I just... And now I understand why no girls in high school liked me. <sighs> 
After not being able to kiss Karlak, we left disappointed but full of rage and took it out on the remaining encounters in the area. Let's go! Urgh! Sorry. Knowing we would want to visit the mountain pass before we end Act 1, I decided to talk my way out of the encounter with Kithric Voss, getting enough experience for level 5. Normally, you think we would take another level into Warlock. Instead, we did the Light Domain Cleric for medium armor proficiency in Warding Flare, which gives disadvantage on attack rolls against you as a reaction. We also gained a couple of cantrips and some first level spell slots we can use to cast our spells instead of being stuck with the Warlock ones. Now that we hit a new power spike, we venture forth into the Underdark. This goes very well. We arrived at the Selenite outpost, looting anything that may have been of use, and ventured forth, quickly being stopped by a bullet, which was not an encounter I could take on right now at my current level. Whoa! There's only. Uh, okay. This is why I recommended it. I once again acquired all of the merchant's items at the Mykonid colony and was told to go kill some slavers because surprise, slavery is in fact bad. This encounter at the docks was very intriguing because the event isn't triggered by line of sight, it's just if you get too close to one of them. So I don't see the point in stealthing in this game if some encounters just happen anyways. Whatever. This one was actually very annoying, even though I brought a temporary ally with me. This is where I rediscover the joys of enemies tossing AoE items even though they should have no idea where I am just to deal damage to me. After multiple reloaded saves, I knocked people off of cliffs enough times to clear the encounter, making my way towards the Grimforge. But of course, Gale had to stop me once I took a long rest, so I friend zoned him harder than any woman before. How do, what should I say here to not get laid by him? Feelings mutual, you're wonderful. Uh... You're a wonderful friend. I gave my fellow friend a handshake and went on my way. On my Disney cruise, more slavers stopped to question me, so I killed all of them by knocking them off the side with Eldritch <laughs> Blasts. Bye bye. I'm just knocking everyone off the boat. Uh. And finally, we arrived at the Grim Forge. There is only one place I need to go right now to the Adamantine Forge. If we get Adamantine Armor, all of those critical hits against me are cancelled, so I will only ever take normal damage from an attack roll. Our first obstacle are the Duragar blocking the path forward to the forge, so we quickly dispose of them, pushing through, finding another encounter I barely managed to win. 25. Oh. Along the way here, you need to pick up these molds, which you can use in conjunction with Mithril Ore to make the adamantine gear. After a couple of combat encounters with animated armors and this swarm of methods, we activated the forge and prepared to fight Grimm. Grim is a level 8 construct with 300 hit points and 20 AC, with a slam attack that deals 4d8 plus 7 damage. So how do you beat him? One word. 
hammer. Perfect. Oh god, it worked. Oh my god, it worked. Hit him again. He is a mirror. Uh, uh, haste, haste. We want to keep him prone. Just need the lava there. Wait, did we win it? No, we didn't. Okay. We should be molten now. Let's go. Oh my god, I'm so smart. We picked up two new armor sets, the Adamantine Splint Mail and the Adamantine Scale Mail, and set out to clear some more encounters. After killing a couple of hook horrors, we find ourselves hunting down a drow slaver named Nier. Luckily for us, he found himself stuck in a cave-in, so we just have to kill all the Duragar on the outside first. This, hands down, was the most frustrated I have been at this run. This is simply because of the way darkness should work. Darkness states that no ranged attacks can be made into or out of it, with the exception of Devil's Sight. Of course, there is always a broken loophole the AI can exploit. For some reason, the throw action doesn't count as a ranged attack. So enemies can just quote unquote throw javelins at you. Like Lariat, please fix this, this is so confusing. If I threw a knife into your chest and it went through a bulletproof vest you were wearing, would the knife go through because the vest is only bulletproof and not knife proof? No, because this is stupid and doesn't make any sense. After that encounter, we grab a rune powder vial from Philomene in order to clear the cave-in. Then, we sit inside darkness to cheese the hell out of Nier. Oh wow, I get stopped. That really sucks. Okay, buddy. I wanna just mess you enemy. up, bro. That hurts, doesn't it? Critical hit. Oh man, you're so terrible. I'll we'll just kill you. After grabbing his head, covered in blood, we return to the Mykonid colony, dropping off their DoorDash delivery. DoorDash rewards us with a level up, and we respec four levels into Warlock and two levels into Tempest Domain Cleric for their ability to maximize thunder and lightning damage. Returning to the surface, my hatred of manipulative old people crept over me, and I set out toward Ethel's cabin. She ran away, clearly scared of my character's TikTok following. I chased her down into her lair, and got the luckiest scenario I have ever found myself in. Oh. My god. What? <laughs> oh my god, okay, awesome. Oh my god, this is the best quick save I've ever had. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm so scared. Okay, let's see if I can get this to knock back. Oh my god. Let's go! This part jumps around and gets a little boring after this, but we move forward past my arena for now. Definitely not because I don't know how to help her. I definitely do. I'm just 
avoiding it for now. <clears throat> we go into the mountain pass knowing there is an NPC merchant, and you know what that means. Hey, so as a side note, this NPC actually has the periapt of wound closure, which lets you maximize healing from any source, which also works on healing potions, so pick this up. We then clear the way through towards the Shadow Curse lands. This encounter was slightly annoying because these Death Shepherds apparently have infinite spell slots, which just allows them to raise a fallen ally at one half their health, making this a really long encounter. After clearing that, we meet Elminster who delivers a message from Gail's ex-girlfriend, who tells him to commit toaster bathtub. Luckily for us, Gail doesn't need to worry because I don't care enough about anyone to put them in my party since this is a solo playthrough and his story doesn't matter. Go to hell. We hop back into the Underdark, exploring and clearing the Arcane Mage Tower, grabbing plenty of loot and spell scrolls, and we also grab the Club of Hill Giant Strength from the top floor, but I don't really use it, so it doesn't it doesn't matter too much. And we finally get to an encounter that would normally be extremely challenging at any difficulty with a party of four characters. The fight with the spectator. I would go into the stats it has and how dangerous it is, but this was actually really easy. Just sit inside darkness and watch as it never attacks you. It's really it's really that simple. We kill the bullet the same way and also kill all of these fish people. Woohoo, XP. Yeah. We respec once again, this time five levels into Warlock for their extra attack feature, and one level into Tempest Domain Cleric for heavy armor proficiency. And we finally set out toward the Gith Yankee Crash. At this point in the game, these early combat encounters are extremely easy even when playing solo. We murder all the drunk kobolds in cold blood, use darkness on the giant eagles, and pick up all these ceremonial weapons on the way, so we can grab the Blood of Lathander, which is a legendary plus 3 mace that allows you to cast 6th level sunbeam, in addition to giving you a once per long rest death ward essentially. So we're gonna want to go pick that up if possible. Once you make your way inside the crash, make your way to this general lady and present the artifact to her. Luckily it's bound to you, so you can't lose it, you know, for story reasons and she'll let you through to Wargaz, who we're just gonna kill because it's just easier that way. None of them are brave enough despite all the big talk they often give, and won't give you any trouble. We just Eldritch Blast our way through this encounter while sitting inside darkness, which for all that stressful buildup is kind of anticlimactic. After that depressing display from her subordinates, Vlakith herself steps in to try to persuade us to turn on our Dream Guardian and threatens us with death. Could you imagine being a god or at least an entity that has demigod-like powers and you can't do anything to a level 6 warlock who's just been spamming a level 2 smoke cloud to get here? Do you, do you know how depressing that is? Ugh. Anyway, we deny her advances and we enter into the artifact. And after talking with our dream guardian who's been protecting us from turning into an illithid all game, we decide not to kill her. Wow. Crazy, right? After that whole ordeal, I knew I needed a long rest before taking on the rest of the crush by myself, but as soon as you exit this area, it's combat for you. Luckily, I have a workaround that lets us take a long rest and gain a new magical item. You remember how we completed the ceremony with the weapons within the temple? That means we can just go grab the Blood of Lathander right now. And you know what's great about the area with the Blood of Lathander? You can take a long rest there since it doesn't qualify as a danger zone, which in addition to letting you rest, you can also fast travel, so we can just leave if we really wanted to. I speed run the trials of Lathander and pick up my new mace, and since we have the Dawnmaster's crest, the entire area doesn't collapse and we get away scot-free. Since we killed a lot of Gith leadership, the entire crush is now aggro towards us. But, by fast traveling, you can find yourself in a much better situation to take these combat encounters. Unfortunately, this becomes rather boring, because all these encounters boil down to casting darkness and then winning. So, we ended up killing every single gith within the crash, and leveled up to level 7, 5 warlock, 2 cleric, stole an egg, and almost had my brain fried from this machine. From this point, we finally come into the home stretch of Act 1 and simply need to clear a few encounters to prepare for Act 2. There is still one merchant in Act 1 we haven't talked to. Brem of the Zentarim. 
We make our way inside their hideout in Joaquin's Rest, since we helped out the other two Zentarem with the gnolls earlier in the run. After taking everything Brem was worth, I noticed that this entire area was covered in explosive barrels. And I need them more than they do, so I help myself. I began talking my way through stealing all the barrels, but failed the second deception check after being invisible. Feeling personally attacked, I attacked back. Luckily, at this point in the run, I have finally turned off Karmic Dice, which makes this much, much easier. After killing all of them, I took any barrel I could get my hands on, and made my way to the back of the cavern where more piles of XP awaited me. After decimating them, I found a unique pair of gloves that may come in handy later, along with a decent amount of gold from this entire dungeon. We returned to the Blighted Village, killing all the goblins there, and the bugbear couple. Marina's husband returns as a zombie, and as a cleric, I can't let that stand, so we kill both of them. No remorse. And we make our way to the final encounter of our playthrough. An enemy that is almost impossible to kill. The Lava Elemental. The thing that makes this encounter difficult is the fact that the Lava Elemental regenerates 10d6 hit points if it stands in lava, which the entire area is coated in, and it can create its own lava. So, naturally, I just anticlimactically knock it off the cliff. Wait, that's it? That- th that's all of Act 1. That's how I'm ending this? I, I- I guess I just thought there'd be more, but I guess a solo run just isn't as hard as I thought it would be. Well, um... I guess I'll see you guys in Act 2. What, what, what you gonna do?